I'm John Batchel with my colleague Malcolm Holine, Conference of Presidents. We go now to the complications created because the Russians suddenly have good friends with the Syrian Kurds. Note this, the Syrian battlefield now involves cross-purposes of geopolitical powers, that would be Russia, the United States, and we could throw in the European Union's actors, France and Germany and Britain, all acting in concert against ISIS. And we could drag in the rest of the region, the Iranians, and Malcolm will mention them momentarily, but the Russians are now backing the Kurds of Syria the YPG closely associated with the Kurds who are at war with Turkey. So it looks paradoxical, and we, we welcome an explanation from a man who can do this in a short order, despite the complications of it, Stephen Cook of the, of the Council on Foreign Relations. Steve, a very good evening to you. The Russians are backing the YPG of Syria, which is clearly completely opposed to the Assad regime. Why? And what does Russia get out of this? Absolutely right. The Syrian Kurds are opposed to the Assad regime. Vladimir Putin is supporting the Assad regime. But the Syrian Kurds and the Russians have a common foe in Turkish leader Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Um, The Kurds uh, are fighting to establish their own uh, independent entity in northern Syria, something that the Turks have declared uh, that they will not tolerate. And, of course, the Russians are angry by the fact that the Turks shot down one of their warplanes uh, a month or so ago. So uh, they have now made common cause in an effort to bring Erdogan down a peg or two. Do, do you see in the proposed peace talks that there's any chance that the Iranians will allow the Kurds to, to participate? And if they don't, and especially after the foreign minister of Russia's strong endorsement of their participation, how, how will this play out? How will they be able to sustain the talks? I, I, I suspect you meant the Turks, and I think that yes, the, the Turks. I, I think that the this is uh, where the United States and Turkey and others are coming in for a very significant diplomatic clash, because I, I think looking at it from any objective angle, the Kurds have to be part of some discussion with regard to Syria. But of course, uh, President Erdogan has made it a matter of principle that the YPG, the Syrian Kurds, are basically the same as the PKK, the Turkish Kurds, who are. Uh, engaged in this war against the Turkish state. Now, on that issue alone, he's not that he he he's actually accurate on that term. But the fact of the matter is, is that the Syrian Kurds are playing an important role in the fight against ISIS, and they're playing an important role in the Syrian civil war. And if there is going to be some discussion about bringing this conflict to an end, as difficult as that may seem to imagine, the Kurds are going to have to be at the table. The Kurds want their own country. The Russians, do they want the Kurds to be independent of Iraq, Iran, uh, uh, Turkey, as well as uh, Azerbaijan, all the rest of it? Do they, does Russia gain from a, a sovereign Kurdistan? No, I don't, think, I don't think they do. And I think what, what's happening with the Russians is, is similar to the way in which the great powers have looked at the Kurds all along, is the pawns in their larger game. And clearly, Vladimir Putin sees an opportunity in working with the Kurds here in order to send a very strong message to uh, the Turks, in particular, the Turkish leader, President Erdogan, who has now been deemed a a virtual enemy of uh, of the Russian state. So uh, no doubt that Putin would ride the Kurds as far as he can and then likely sell them out at the end just like the United States has done in the past, just like other countries have done in the past. Uh, John, do you think this is uh, the Russians adopting the old Arab adage that uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend and that it is driving them together? It would seem that that is... Uh, I measure, Malcolm, and Steve, I'd like you to comment on this, that the minorities of the region have been the glue that holds the whole of the Ummah together, together for the last thousand years. And that the destruction of the uh, minorities, most notably the, the Yazidis and the genocide Ablate. visited on the Yazidis, uh, suggests that without those minorities, the, the sovereign states collapse. Steve, is that fair, that uh, we need the minorities to be empowered, if not sovereign? Well, I do think that you, as you look at the current 
capacious failure of the region, there is something that is common throughout, and that is that uh, minorities are under threat and under attack, and at the same time, states are collapsing. So there's, I don't, it's very hard to determine whether this is causation or correlation, but certainly these two things are happening at the same time. Well, what, what do you think uh, uh, is the influence of the fact that the Iranians now have established themselves very strongly in Iraqi Kurdistan, much of the consternation certainly of our country and of others and fear about what the ramifications of that would be. How does this play into the picture you just described? Well, the Iranians, like every other major actor in the region, are going to seek to defend, reinforce, and extend their interests in the region. They do have a history of having good relations with the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, who are also allies of the United States. I think the, those Iraqi Kurds living close to the Iranians uh, really have no choice but to have uh, good relations with them. But I think what the larger question is, is that now with the uh, the Arab states, Iraq, Syria in particular, failing, it's clear that the Iranians are going to use these uh, problems and, and troubles that are uh, occurring in, in these countries to extend its influence throughout the region. This is, a, this is a continuity in Iranian foreign policy, this effort to extend its influence beyond its shores to the western side of the Persian Gulf, and the collapse of these countries is just providing them the opportunity. All right, to collapse, Steve. Project out 10 years. Is Turkey stable enough to last 10 years? Are there elements of Turkey that will fall apart? You know, it's a really interesting question because when people talk about states in the region being contrivances, they never include Turkey. But actually, Turkey is one of those countries that is a contrivance. It was the imagination of one guy, Mustafa Kemal, known universally as Ataturk. And it is, there is, a, within the realm of possibility, there is plausible, uh, a plausible situation, scenario in which you know, Iraqi Kurds go their own way. Uh, Erdogan and the party um, kind of uh, overplay their hand in Turkey. This kind of builds further on a kind of this nationalist class, this nationalist identity clash between Kurds and Turks. And there's always that possibility. This is obviously the Turkish nightmare. So in terms of whether Turkey would break up, it's very hard to prognosticate. Turkey in for a big fight with the Kurds? I think it goes without Stephen saying. Cook of the Council on Foreign Relations, Malcolm Honline, Conference of Presidents, Major American Jewish Organizations. I'm John Batchelor.